introduce a very well-known Luther scholar, namely Dr. George Farrell. Let me say two things. Number one, how we got to the uh, present status in Luther research, and number two, uh, who Dr. Farrell is within this situation. At the beginning of this century, a German uh, historian theologian by the name of Karl Hall started what has been usually called the New Renaissance or the uh, New Enlightened Luther Research. And so what we know about Martin Luther in the Reformation era is quite different from what we knew a hundred years ago. This is the year, 1996, that we celebrate the 450th anniversary of Luther's death. But the kind of new research is really quite astounding. Out of Karl Hall's research, we have the work of Wilhelm Pauk, primarily in the second and third quarter of this century. And from Pauk, we have his numerous pupils, including Yaroslav Pelikan, who teaches at Yale University. Another one who comes uh, out of the whole research is George Farrell because of his influence at the University of Iowa and the many teachers and professors that have been graduated from that institution, it has spawned a great number of scholars. Others that we might mention uh, are the British scholars Gordon Rupp and Philip Watson. Uh, we might mention such people as Lewis Spitz, who worked at Stanford. We might mention such people as Jim Kittleston, who is now at Ohio State, and we might mention um, uh, the great scholar at Duke, uh, Steinmetz. And so, uh, after a century of concentrated Lutheran and Luther and Reformation research, we're privileged to have one of the best, one of the premium scholars of the 20th century, Dr. George Farrell. He has graciously agreed to teach this small seminar of 14 students here at Concordia University. And uh, uh, he has uh, <clears throat> completed uh, his own Lutheran clergy credentials. He's a Luther scholar. The area of research that occurs in about the 22 or so books that he has edited or authored have frequently been on the side of Luther and his ethics. So Luther and ethics is his primary focus of study. Uh, for more than 20 years, he taught at the University of Iowa, Iowa being the premium university among the Big Ten universities uh, in the area of offering a PhD in the area of religion. There is so much more to say about George Farrell, uh, his credentials, his writings, his humor, his inspiration are, uh, are part of that record. And I think it is best for that record to speak for itself. And so uh, it is my honor to introduce to this class for the next 14 episodes in a seven week period, Dr. George Farrell. Thank you, Dr. Mansky. First of all, I want to tell you I'm very happy to be with you. I hope uh, we will eventually proceed to a class which is less formal than this one, where we can sit around the table or something and uh, conduct this uh, investigation that we are uh, entering upon in a little less formal manner. Uh, Dr. Mansky referred to my humor so uh, to show that I'm not impressed by being televised, I'll tell you a joke. <laughs> it's a story about, uh, it has something to do with the introduction that uh, Dr. Mansky gave me. And uh, you know how you always feel. Uh, as if you heard your obituary. <laughs> and uh, 
I would like to tell the story about the British princess about <clears throat> uh, 75 years ago, the, who were the three boys. Uh, one eventually became Edward, uh, King Edward, and didn't last very long in that position because of an American woman. He fell in love with uh, the other one was King George, who, who was the king during the uh, Second World War. But when these boys were little, there was a sudden snow, a blizzard in London, and that occurs very rarely, but it really snows. The Gulf Stream takes care of it, but by and large, uh, there isn't much snow in London. But there was uh, quite a little bit of snow, and the kids were playing in Buckingham Palace in the garden and uh, had a snowball fight, but there was a much better snowball fight going on outside. And so they got away from their supervision and got into a big snowball fight on the outside, in which, in the course of the snowball fight, a couple of windows were broken, and the whole bunch of disheveled-looking kids was being arrested and brought to the magistrate. He called on the first boy and says, what's your name? He says, I, sir, am the Prince of Wales. He went to the second one and said, what's your name? I, sir, am the Duke of York. So he went to the third boy and said, what's your name? I, sir, am the Duke of Kent. The fourth boy's eyes had gotten bigger and bigger. And when the magistrate came to me and said, what's your name? He said, I stick with my bodies. I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's keep that in mind. I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury. In this uh, uh, relatively short period, we want to do an awful lot. Uh, I want you to read rather thoroughly this entire book. Uh, does everybody have this book? You know where to get it. Uh, I want you to read uh, large sections of this book. And I want you to listen to me and argue with me. I enjoy arguments. And I love, and you know, Luther was a very argumentative character. Uh, it, uh, he enjoyed arguments. People who hear him now uh, always forget that he would argue with people uh, very bitterly and you would get the impression that you would never speak to them again but he might go out for a beer with them afterwards. It was a different kind of uh, theological debate from our time. Uh, it was much more uh, ad hominem, very personal, uh, but uh, people saw it within the context of an adversary system like, uh, very much like American law, where you have also a prosecution and a defense, and these two sides do the best they can to present their particular case, but uh, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily mad at each other. Uh, they just try the best to make a strong case for their position. This is really how theology was taught as we, will, we shall see in the course of our study. We, we start our reading, and by the way, I want you to have read by next next Thursday uh, the material on, from page 1 to 68 in, this, in the Lull book, and pages 13 to 36 in the other book. And we will proceed in the following manner, starting on Thursday. I shall lecture for about uh, 50 minutes or 30 minutes or however long I feel like lecturing on uh, Luther's theology. And then uh, I shall read with you and discuss with you the material in this book that is assigned for the particular session. And I will assume that you can all discuss it with me. And I will ask you questions and ask you what these particular uh, ideas of 
sentences mean, and I hope we will all get into the discussion. As we are sitting now, it's not so easy, but and I hope that this television doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother me, it shouldn't bother you. Just ignore it and just say what, what you want to say and see whether we can learn something. You will learn more from, from reading Luther if you get into a discussion about the material you have read. And then I will discuss with you uh, the articles in my book. Uh, the reason for that is they are an attempt to apply what I have learned from Luther to the contemporary world. And my claim, of course, is that Luther's study is not an engagement in archaeology. We are not trying to dig up somebody who has nothing to say to us. I have always claimed, and I still claim, that Luther is extremely useful to us in our time and in the conflicts that uh, confront us in our time. I hope that will become apparent as we go along. Uh, first of all, then, I would like you to read for next Thursday, Lull 1 to 16, and the other book, page, page of 30 to 36. If you haven't gotten this material, I shall now hand it out help yourself to one copy, and that will, uh, will uh, probably uh, uh, help you to uh, know what I'm asking from you. There are certain assignments which are listed in, uh, on this sheet. One is every student is expected to attend every session of the class and participate in the class discussion. Uh, eventually, I will ask you to tell me something about yourself. You've heard something about me. I would like to know something about you before too long. Then uh, there will be a 6,000-word, 20-page paper which uh, will deal with an aspect of Luther theology based on Luther's own writing. In other words, it is supposed to be a paper based on primary sources. Since most of you, I understand, do not know Latin or German, you will depend very largely on the 55 volumes in the American edition, which is in the library. And, uh, uh, but then there are some other things by Luther in some other uh, editions that you might want to consult. But um, practically, a, a very substantial part of Luther's primary writings are in English in the American edition. Um, this paper is due on March 7th, 1996. This will put you under some considerable pressure because that's the day, the last day of, uh, that we meet. So while you go to class, you also are supposed to write a paper. Now, I do not know any other way of proceeding. So I, I will assume that you can do that. Uh, if you have some particular reasons why you would like to do it a different way, you must talk to me. But the first assignment for you is that you have to make up your mind what in Luther you want to study particularly. Let me give you some examples. You could do a thorough study of one or another of Luther's writings. Uh, to, to read it with great care and uh, analyze it and criticize it. And it's what of what Luther is saying here is of permanent importance for the life of the Christian church, what is the result of his own time and of limited value to us. All this could do by applying yourself to, let me give you an example. One of Luther's important writings is his uh, 
address to the Christ Christian nobility of the German nation. I think it's a particularly significant piece of work. But uh, what does this approach mean to us? We couldn't have an address to the Christian nobility of the American nation. They don't have any nobility. So how would you handle Luther's approach if you were trying to understand it from within the context of America in 1996? I think you would have to say the people responsible for our life together are the American people. We the people. And so what was Luther's approach and his uh, address to the German nobility mean if you translate it as an address to the American people? Or with more specificity to the Christians among the American people and their responsibility. And then you would have to, to uh, do all kinds of things. You have to ask yourself, uh, Luther dealt with the relatively homogeneous uh, nation in which uh, all people practically, with one exception, all people with one exception, were baptized Christians. All the Catholics were baptized Christians, all the Muslims were baptized Christians, uh, the Calvinists were baptized Christians. The only people that weren't baptized Christians were the Jews which produced all kinds of problems for Luther, as you know, and you could deal with that particular issue as well. And, uh, but it also meant that Luther, in his whole life, never meant, met an Asian, never meant, met an African. He may have met a few Muslims, Turks, because the Turks played an important part in uh, Germany and at least a few ambassadors, German ambassadors to the Turks visited Luther and uh, talked to him about the reaction of the Sultan to Luther. Uh, the Sultan, as an aside, was not entirely unfavorable to Luther. The reason being that what he did pay any attention to Luther's theology, he knew that Luther uh, was uh, a problem for the emperor. And you know, in the, in the 16th century, the Turks were at the gates of Vienna. And in 1529, they were sur had surrounded Vienna. If you know your Reformation history, you will know that the Augsburg Diet was in 1530, a year after the Turks had surrounded Vienna and left without capturing it because they had trouble at home and they had to get back. But uh, the Turks played an immensely important part in uh, uh, the attitude of the emperor towards the Lutheran Reformation. This thing was made even more complicated, just to, as an aside, as a footnote, was made more complicated because the Pope, who was really more upset about the emperor than he was about Luther. Luther was a sideshow as far as he was concerned. He was an interesting theology. <laughs> and so, but he was very interested in, in territorial politics. And uh, the emperor was uh, uh, threatening uh, the uh, position of the papacy, not as a religious power, but as a political power. And this situation uh, made the pope actually negotiate with the Turks, with the Muslim Turks, against the emperor. There's some fantastic research has been done about the correspondence in which the Pope quite 
uh, unashamedly negotiated with the Turks because the Turks were allies in his effort to reduce the power of Charles V, who was uh, a, uh, an emperor who uh, made considerable demands. You know, perhaps, that eventually uh, the, the, the emperor captured Rome. And he captured it very largely with Lutheran soldiers. These Lutheran soldiers who fought uh, for the emperor with enthusiasm, especially when it was against the pope. And the pope was all, uh, and, 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 and the emperor always believed that he was a defender of the privileges of the religious privileges. I'm telling you this confusing story not to confuse you, but to suggest to you that you could take something like Luther's writing to the German princes to see what this kind of approach would mean if we would try to think like Luther in 1996. What would we have to say? What would a person like Luther have to say? in our situation. That would be one thing, but you could also do all kinds of things uh, about the development of the German language, for example, the whole cultural significance of Luther. The, uh, uh, the, uh, there, there are, you will see that if you look at his uh, other writings, and for example, his uh, writings on, on in, in the conflict with Erasmus, if you could, you could think about Luther as a counselor. We have uh, books, uh, uh, one volume from the Library of Christian Classics called uh, Letters of Spiritual Counsel. And you could take this, this book and analyze what kind of a counselor was Luther. You could take real controversial issues, Luther and women. Uh, the, obviously, he was a uh, patriarch. He thought like a patriarch. Uh, what of this, what he wrote in that context, is very much 16th century. What, what, of it, what is uh, applicable in 20th century terms? Uh, there are all kinds of things that you could do. I hope you will think about that very hard in the next few weeks, because, as I said, uh, by February 2nd, which only gives you about more than a week. I would like you to have made up your mind. And then come to me with a proposal. Uh, one page typewritten in which you say what you would like to study. You are not bound by that. But that would be a first proposal. And sometimes when you do something like that, you learn very soon that uh, What you thought was a workable project turns out to be too big, but you can't do it that way. Then you have to cut it down. That's perfectly all right. Don't worry about it. Um, there will be a final examination on March 7th. It will be open book. You can bring an inside Peter of Britannica if you can carry it. <laughs> and uh, there's no, uh, there will be no pressure of uh, the Memorize stuff. You bring your books along, and it will be uh, probably one or two questions of considerable generality. My students have always hated my tests. They have absolute proof against cheating. There's no way you can possibly cheat in my test. <laughs> because uh, if you start uh, uh, copying stuff at that point, it will show. You have only three hours, and these three hours you, you will have to deal with a very extensive uh, topic and so uh, the best thing in preparation for this test is to read the assignments and to uh, think ahead of time uh, how you want to deal with uh, such questions. Now, um, 
Are there any questions from you on these general rules that I have here established? Is that all very clear? I hope. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, let me tell you I'm hard of hearing, so you have to talk very loud. Okay. How are we to get hold of you? How oh, are you going to get hold of me? For, for uh, well, well, I can give you a telephone number, first of all. Do you have an office on campus? Yeah, I, uh, no, in Irvine. Okay. And uh, I'll give you my telephone number. That is 733-3073. I'm sorry, what was it? 733-3073. And uh, we can make appointments. I will have on Thursday and Monday a study a office here available. And I will probably be there in the afternoon of Thursday to, uh, to uh, meet with you if you want to meet with me in that sense. Uh, the, we might also the addition make appointments Monday or whenever. Are all of you from the campus here? How, uh, those of you are quite some distance. We will have to we will have to decide how we meet and whether they can come in a little earlier and uh, and we meet before class or something like that. Uh, any other questions? If you don't have any other questions, I will start with a fairly formal lecture and, uh, and see, and, and I want you to feel free to interrupt me at any time, and uh, especially if you don't know what I'm talking about, or if uh, uh, I have expressed myself in an unnecessarily obscure uh, fashion. Let me begin with the problem of talking about Luther's theology. Luther never wrote a systematic theology. Unlike Thomas Aquinas, unlike Karl Barth, Friedrich Schleiermacher, Paul Tillich, Luther never tried to write a system where you start with the doctrine of God and end with the eschatology, with the last things. Luther was, all <coughs> during his professional life, a Lector Biblie. We would say a professor of Old and New Testament. He was a professor of Old and New Testament. And besides his lectures, he influenced people through his sermons because he preached regularly through his hymns, which were one of the most effective ways of his uh, proclamation. And he did not try to build what we would call a systematic theology. Luther's theology was the exposition of the Word of God. He was trying to renew and improve the exegesis of the scriptures as he found it in his time. I will say something more about that next, uh, this coming. Thursday because there is an article in your book which deals with this problem that yeah, the, the, the scriptures were 
not useful before Luther came for the reformation of the church because the exegesis that the church had adopted, that the medieval church had adopted, was allegorical. And the allegorical exegesis enabled people to make anything mean anything. The allegorical interpretation, you could make any passage of scripture mean anything that you wanted to mean. So when you had a conflict, the various authorities would all quote scripture on behalf of their particular position and with the help of the allegorical method it was quite possible to make it mean almost anything. And then how did you settle it? You called in the magisterium, the teaching office of the church. And so the power of the magisterium substituted for the authority of the scriptures. Sometimes the magisterium would say the position of theologian A is right, and sometimes it would say the position of theologian B is right, and in rare instances they would say, the Pope would say, I have no opinion on the subject, and so far, no decision. A very important uh, instance of that is the notion of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which was not the dogma until the 19th century, because the magisterium didn't decide this. You know, there were authorities opposed to the Immaculate Conception of Mary, like Thomas Aquinas, and there were others, like the Franciscan tradition, that was very highly in support of it. And the Pope, for a long time, or the papacy for a long time, did not take a position on this particular controversial issue. But ultimately, it was not referred to the scriptures. On that particular issue, what would you do with the scriptures? Scriptures don't say a word on, on that subject. But the, 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 issue, the issue was debated, and then the ultimate decision was made by the papacy. Luther uh, changed the method of exegesis. He, re he uh, rejected allegory as uh, the means of doing uh, biblical exegesis, although he had a tendency to fall back into it every once in a while. He had been raised with it, and so you will see, he will say eloquently, I don't want to anything to do with allegory, then probably do all kinds of allegorical things. You can see that, for example, if you read his Genesis commentary, he does it every once in a while. It's really carried away with, with uh, that kind of interpretation. But, but when you put his foot to the fire and ask him, how does one decide it? Then he had a new key to the scripture. In German, was Christum time. What drives Christ home? Luther had a Christocentric interpretation of scripture. And this Christocentric interpretation of scripture enabled him to use scripture against the authority of the magisterium of the, of, of the hierarchy. Now, he believed that what he was doing was really following in the footsteps of Augustine and the Apostle and the Apostle Paul. That he was recovering the way in which the, the scripture itself had interpreted itself. You know, Paul writes, interprets scripture. And Luther thinks the way Paul interprets scripture is the key to the way Christians ought to read the scripture. Uh, all his writings, as Luther deals with them, 
are exegesis. He did not even want to a, develop a theological system. He wanted to help people to understand the Word of God. And that meant he wanted people to understand how to live as Christians, to give answers to the questions raised in his time, in his time, on the basis of a Christocentric reading of the scriptures. Now, uh, every once in a while I like to say things that they make everybody mad. And it is the conventional wisdom that Calvin is a great systematic theologian and Luther is a great scriptural theologian. And that's what you read in every text, and that's the conventional wisdom. My claim is you could turn it around because underlying Luther's exegesis of scripture is a vision a systematic vision of the centrality of Christ, of the centrality of the second article of the Creed. I want to call it to your attention because, uh, in my judgment, one of the reasons that Luther is so important for us in our time is that of all the articles of the Creed, of all three, it is the second article of the Creed that is particularly under attack. We have relatively little problems with the first article. Almost everybody uh, who is at all interested in theology believes in creation. There is no great argument between the religion they all believe in creation. And uh, if you discuss, dis discuss a third article vaguely enough, then everybody is in favor of spirituality. And in fact, spirituality is a very in thing at the present moment. So nobody has many thing, much to say against uh, the Holy Spirit or the, the, the Spirit of God. But the path is in the fire when you talk about Jesus Christ because that is where the spirits are divided. That is, which, that is the aspect of Christianity which is under attack in our time. And uh, for Luther, the second article of the Creed is the key to the understanding of the first of the Creed. And uh, we will see that in many ways and you will uh, you, as you read your, your uh, uh, material from Luther, it might help you. And now I'm going to pause here for a couple of seconds and uh, give you a chance to make any comments that you might want to make on what I've said so far. Yes? We had a, uh, a rabbi. tell you something about the allegorical method that might help you understand how this happens. Uh, the allegorical method was not invented by the Christians. The allegorical method was invented by the Greeks. By the, and it was invented by the, by, by the Greeks because they had these stories about the gods that they couldn't handle. I mean, an intelligent Greek philosopher was embarrassed by the stories about the gods that we read in Homer, you know, I mean, where the gods fight, where they, get in, where they commit adultery, all this stuff 
is, is the, uh, people like Plato took the position that in this ideal state, in the Republic, that he, you know, this ideal state he described, nobody would be allowed to read Homer. <laughs> the Greek classics, you know, they wouldn't be allowed to read Homer or Hazy because of this, uh, he felt that these gods um, uh, undercut uh, basic uh, morality. So what the Greeks did is to develop the allegorical method, about which we will say something more eventually. And the Jews picked it up from the Greeks and Maimonides and others and applied it to the Old Testament and did a lot of allegorical uh, interpretation. And uh, so that was really the conventional wisdom. Everybody was doing it. And Luther's uh, unwillingness to pursue this. But you know, I, I, I think it's, just, it's a very good question. And I think we should pursue all these uh, leads because you see, we have now a new interpretation of scripture. I mean, in, in the second half of the last 10, 15 years. Uh, deconstruction. Deconstruction is a literary theory, but it has been applied by a lot of people to the scriptures. And deconstruction really means that anybody can make the scripture mean anything you want. There is this book about that the J source in the, in the uh, uh, Pentateuch was a woman. I mean, this, is, this guy who wrote this book uh, uh, has no, doesn't know Hebrew. He, he, he has the foggiest idea what he's talking about, but it was a bestseller. You know? people, people buy into all these absolutely hair-brained skills, and the idea is there isn't anything like a real past or real history. History is only what people say it is what they make up. In fact, we have the whole problem of uh, autobiography. Autobiography is what you think about yourself today. A year from now, you might think something else, and you have a totally different autobiography. I mean, th this, is th and th this has been applied to the scriptures, and there you have the same kind of uh, scheme where everything then means whatever you want it to. There has to be some center. And for Luther, the center was to express. I'm sure, I mean, that, that's why he interpreted, he called the uh, book of Genesis a true gospel book. If you read his commentary on Genesis, you see that he reads the whole Bible through Jesus Christ. That's different from allegory because it doesn't have a fulfilled full meaning. Our allegory always has its fulfilled meaning. But it is also a very, a very uh, idiosyncratic way of reading them, especially the Old Testament. The Christians read the Old Testament as a witness to Jesus Christ. And uh, Luther didn't think there was any other way of reading it. Yes? So then the exegesis is redemptive, is what we yes. mean. Redemptive. But now, how does this fit in with the analogy of faith? Well, uh, there is a center to the whole uh, dealings of God with human beings. And the center is the atonement. The center is uh, the article in which the church stands or falls, that, uh, that, that, that Christ died for us. And he reads everything through that. And so the... the uh, the, the, uh, I mean, but that's how Paul and the, the New Testament Christians read Isaiah 53. This is a very Christocentric reading of uh, Isaiah. And I can see why Jews wouldn't read it that way. If they read it that way, they wouldn't be Jews. <laughs> And I know a lot of Jews that read it that way, they no longer are Jews, you know. <laughs> they, they became Christians because, because they read it that way. So there is a different way of reading. And, and I'm not saying Luther's way is the objective way. I don't even know what that means. Luther's way is a Christocentric way of reading scripture. 
And you, are you I mean, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't tell you that if I weren't convinced that as you read the stuff, you'll see that I'm right. <laughs> that, that that's how he reads it. Now, since Luther's time, Lutheran theologians and Christian theologians in general have tried again and again to systematize Luther's theology. That means they were never quite happy with Luther's unsystematic way of doing things. Uh, and uh, try to discover the key to the system. Uh, the Germans in particular love system. And you know, uh, you don't become a professor in a German university unless you have developed some system with your own language, uh, your own complicated German vocabulary, which you have invented for the purpose of uh, the system. Uh, and of course, Luther became uh, an interesting subject for this approach. Uh, much of the uh, controversy about Luther were really controversies about uh, the way in which you must read Luther to get to this true insight, this system that is hidden uh, behind everything. And uh, this didn't only involve Lutherans, but for example, two Roman Catholics at the beginning of the century, the 20th century. Uh, made a major contribution to the systematic reading of Luther. One was Denefler, a Dominican, D E N. And the other was Grisar, a Jesuit. And Denefle essentially uh, reduced Luther to a person who had uh, moral problems. And uh, it was uh, these moral problems that made it impossible for him to stay within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Grisar, uh, was more sophisticated. <laughs> he thought he had psychological problems. And that's what made it impossible for him to stay. But that meant, of course, that a bunch of Lutherans uh, were writing against Denethor and Grisard. We have a whole slew of writings at the beginning of the century, which, however, led people to read Luther. And we have a great deal of very serious Luther scholarship in, as a result of these attacks against Luther from uh, Denethle and Grisa. Uh, and uh, the net result of this was also that a lot of Catholics read Luther. And so, uh, Catholic scholars. And so by the middle of the century, there was a new way of appreciating Luther as uh, a Catholic theologian. Uh, Peter Manns, for example, is one of these. But what, uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, there is, uh, in, in, in about 25 years ago, about 30 years ago, a Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Iser, I-S-E-R, -E 
gewone bak met de challenging type of the thesen anschlag fand nicht statt which means the thesis were never posted <laughs> and uh, created an immense uproar uh, now the problem was I want to tell you very easily, very obviously, we have no evidence that Luther posted the 95, which he never succeeded. That's what he's an about the skull. And the story is first told by Melanchthon, but it's told at Luther's funeral. And that's not a good time for Luther to speak up and say, hey, that wasn't the way it was. Now, why would Isolo try to claim that Luther never posted the 95 Theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. You know, if you go to Wittenberg now, they are there in bronze. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no question about that. So what was the point of Isolo's book? The point was that Luther was such a good Catholic that he would never have attacked the church without going to the channel. So he wrote the pieces and sent them to his bishop, which is true. We have the evidence. Luther says that. He did send them to him. He never says that he, put, that he nailed them on the door of the castle. But he, that is, he went through channels. And only when the channels broke down, only when there was no response from the authorities, did he uh, get involved in the country. So, so Isolo's claim that Luther didn't nail the thesis on the door of the castle <coughs> is really an effort to show how good a Catholic Luther was. Uh, that's, that's typical for the research, the Luther research of the middle of the century, that many Luther scholars, Roman Catholic Luther scholars, tried to show that, Lu that Luther was really not that moral monster that Denifin had talked about, or that mentally sick person that Grisa had talked about, but that he was a serious Catholic theologian who belonged into the mainstream of Catholic, uh, of the Catholic tradition. Uh, and, and so, so you have, uh, uh, you have a ecumenical result of this attempt to understand Luther. I would say the reason why Luther has such a wide appeal, not only to Roman Catholics and Lutherans, but he's quoted uh, by Calvin, and he is quoted uh, by Bart, and he has uh, uh, plays a great important part in the conversion of Wesley. Uh, it's uh, Luther's importance, ecumenical importance, is a result that after 1500 years of Christian history wanted to recapture the way in which the Bible was interpreted in the New Testament church. He never wanted to give you his private opinion. He was not interested in a Lutheran theology. He was trying to restate as concisely and clearly as possible what he believed to be the common Christian theology. Uh, all of you know the small catechism. The small catechism is a brilliant restate of the common Christian theology without any idiosyncratic Lutheran emphasis. It's, it's, a, it, it's a statement of what Luther saw as the main thrust of the Christian message. No particular differences from that Christian message as Luther believed it represented in the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. 
because the Holy Spirit, as he says in the small catechism, calls all of Christianity, calls, Geruf sammelt, erleucht, calls, collects, enlightens, and sanctifies in one thing. Right there in the small catechism itself. But Luther's influence is not limited to the realm of the church. Luther is a major figure in secular history. Through the Reformation, the political situation in Europe was changed fundamentally. And the emphasis on the translation of the Bible into the vernacular language. It's not only into German, that's what Luther did. But as a result of his German translations, all those who were influenced by Luther translated the Bible into their particular language, into Swedish, and into English, and into Slovak. There were innumerable translations of the Bible, which produced a culture in the vernacular, a literary culture in the vernacular. Uh, I once spent some time in Africa and uh, talked to some, I was of course lecturing on Luther, this is my wife. And I talked to somebody who had taken one of my lectures in London. And he said, you know why I'm so interested in Luther? I said, I don't know. We are engaged in nation data. And I see uh, Luther as a great pioneer in nation data. Well, this was an interesting, interesting sideline. And of course, he had got no hold of an aspect of Luther's influence and importance. Uh, the development of the emphasis on the mother tongue, which became essential for modernity. Uh, it Something was lost in the process. At Luther's time, if you wanted to study anything, you could go any place in Europe, to any university, and follow the lectures, because they were all in Latin. Whether you studied in Oxford, or in Bologna, in Paris, or in Prague, Wherever you went, you had access to the language of scholarship because there was only one, and that was Latin. As you know, Luther wrote much, much of his material in Latin. Ninety-five theses were written in Latin. Latin was uh, a universal language, and when Luther uh, help to break this monopoly of Latin, he also broke this community. For the longest time, Latin remained the language of scholarship. I mean, that didn't happen overnight. Everybody still learned Latin. I had nine years of Latin in the gymnasium in Germany and Austria, where I studied, uh, one hour a day, six days a week. We didn't have Saturday off. And uh, my grandfather could write essays in Latin, which I only did 
under duress. <laughs> it was very difficult for me, both for my grandfather, there was no problem at all. My father could uh, write Latin slowly, and I could I could read it. I couldn't write it anymore. But this this was this was even in the beginning of the 20th century. This was still wrong. Uh, only in the uh, late 19th century was Latin abolished as the official language of Hungary. Uh, if you know how difficult Hungarian was to see how much easier it was if you could <laughs> to communicate in Latin rather than Hungarian. But everywhere in Latin was retained as the language of scholarship. And as you know, uh, some of my degrees in America were written in Latin. They, they, were, they, 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 they used Latin for, for, for my PhD. But uh, that was a remnant of this uh, fact that at one time Latin was really the universal language of scholarship. And it was every, a foreign language to everyone. You know, it wasn't something that, that you spoke at home. It was something that you learned and, and if you wanted to be a scholar. And uh, Luther broke this, or began this break with that tradition. And uh, uh, created uh, a, the modern German language is to a very large extent the result of Luther's translation of the Bible. Uh, there were innumerable dialects in German. And Luther created a language that all Germans could understand, even though they didn't speak. They didn't speak of the, the, the Bible, but they, that, that, that standard German. But there was a standard Swedish, and a standard, uh, a standard English, and you see the, the language of Shakespeare is not the Cockney language, it's not the language of the various regions of England, it is the language of the King James Bible. And so you have, uh, you have here a development which uh, had, the, had fantastic uh, cultural significance. Uh, another element was that because Luther wanted everybody to have access to the scripture. You had to teach everybody how to read. And uh, very soon, literacy developed in the countries affected by the Reformation. And this literacy, of course, did not only make people, enable people to read the Bible, but to read in general. And so, uh, it was a byproduct of this insistence that every person should have access to God's word. So Luther is a significant figure, not only in theology, but in the history of education, the history of culture in general. I don't think it is without significance that the most famous Afro-American is called Martin Luther King. His father and his grandfather believed that Martin Luther, they had the representative of what Christianity is all about. How well they understood Luther, I mean, to your judgment. But that uh, Luther has played an important part also among people that had no background in the German Reformation is obvious and symbolized by the name of uh, this <coughs> important the spokesperson for Black America. Now, I will now take a little break, and uh, then we will continue in about 
Maybe I can make an announcement or two while we take this break. It's my understanding the bookstore is open. I'll interrupt my presentation briefly and have all of you and quoted always as WA. Weimar is a city in Germany. It's a Weimar edition. It was started in 1883 and it is sort of finished now. Sort of finished because uh, in spite of the fact that it has over 140 volumes. Do you have a Weimar edition here? Uh, we are in the process of purchasing yeah. one. We yeah. do not own yeah. one. But, but uh, uh, I should have brought at least one volume along. It's a, a wonderful critical edition. Uh, with that critical edition means that it, when Luther quotes somebody, they try to find out where you can find this quotation and so on. It's, it's a, it, it, and when he misquotes the scriptures, they show where he made the mistake and why he picked up. Well, you know, all the, Luther never took notes, you know. He, he just did it from uh, spontaneously. But when you do things spontaneously, as you all know, you sometimes make mistakes. And these critical editions try to uh, avoid that. The trouble is that the first volumes that came in the last century, that came in after 1883, were not prepared with the care that the last volumes have been prepared. So we are now in the process of uh, recovering by redoing some of the earlier volumes. And uh, the, uh, the, the, this process is, is, is still going on. A great part of what is known as Luther's writings is, consists of notes based on the memory of other people. Uh, these are students' notes, of lecture, lecture notes. We had, don't have the lecture notes, on the school notes on some of the later writings. For example, the Genesis Commentary. And we are dependent on student notes that have been uh, influenced by the student how good a student he was, and how precise he was. In. And we sometimes can compare various notes and in that way uh, establish the Luther's thought. But we, we will have to get back to this in a moment. Lecture notes, sermon notes, and table talk. Five volumes five or six volumes in the Weimar uh, edition. By volumes, I mean that big. It's table volumes. Luther invited lots of people for dinner. His wife always felt that he was over the general in his invitation. And uh, spoke freely. And everybody sat down. And if they were good at taking notes, took notes. And sometimes we have the same story told from two different points of view, and we have some uh, people whose notes we trust more than other people, and of course we also have some of the more controversial remarks of Luther, who did not always talk like a church father, but often used language that was uh, never obscene, but often scatological, if you know the difference. I mean, he, he, he was an earthly person, and there are some of these in the American edition. I understand that the nice person who was proofreading them cried a number of times because Blessed Martin was using such awful words. 
keep in mind that lots of people use these kinds of words, uh, not only the American football players. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, mostly they have to do, I mean, the shocking, most shocking ones I have to do with excrement. Now, in a, in a 16th century small town, excrement was something that came to mind frequently. It was before uh, flush plumbing, and, uh, and it, there was a lot of it around. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see, you could see why why uh, it lent itself to illustrating uh, a certain point. Uh, I am not suggesting that to be a good Lutheran you have to use language like that, but I want to prepare you. If you have run into it, 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 it was not unusual. I am sure uh, Erasmus didn't use language. Like and I'm sure the lunch you would like to say that. But uh, uh, it was Luther who had also the ear of the people because he was able to use language that almost everybody could understand. <laughs> uh, they are particularly uh, frequent. Yes? Can I ask you a further question on that? Is that really unique to Luther or in fact, do you find any contemporaries, I don't care whether they're theologians or not, that talk that way? Well, no, uh, well, uh, I tell you, there are people, I think Melanchthon and Calvin uh, were not, were very uh, reticent about, and, uh, and particular about their language. I think there were lots of other people that talked like Luther. Only Luther often used them with such, such they be, become such colorful illustrations that I'm sorry that politeness prevents me from giving you <laughs> examples because they, are, they really make his point very clearly. And, uh, and, and he, it's not gratuitous uh, language. But so much of scatological or obscene language that most of my students use. I'm, I've taught in a secular university for most of my life. Uh, the, uh, uh, is, is meaningless. You know what I mean? It, is, uh, it, it, it doesn't say anything. It's just filled words that don't, that, Ill, don't, that wasn't the way Luther used it. Uh, he, he used it to make a, a point and uh, then it becomes, it's like Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare can use language like that, especially in some of his not so polite characters. And, uh, and, and, and it makes a point that Luther, in his, in his uh, use of such words, uh, does make a point. And I, I think you're right, he wasn't the only one. But he, he was uh, uh, a person that uh, people used as a model, and they upset when he a model uses language. A related yes. point. Do you, were there ever any of his associates that took him to task for it? Uh, no. By the time the table talks are written, he is such a uh, respected person that uh, even people that disagree with him are too polite to do that. Calvin never said a bad word about Luther. He picked on all the Lutherans he could, you know, uh, in his, in, in, in his uh, for example, in the institutes. But Luther himself never said anything bad about him. Uh, Melanchthon was frequently embarrassed by the coarseness of Luther's language. Uh, That depended on his mood, too. One of my students has written a book that just came out on the Schmalkaut articles. I don't know if they do. His name is William Ross. It's just, just came out this fall. And the Schmalkaut articles, where he speaks very clean language, but the Schmalkaut articles are written when Luther is very sick. And uh, Russell shows how sick he was, how close to dying he was. 
And uh, it is uh, this uh, life situation of Luther that often is reflected in his life. But when he feels terrible, he uses often terrible lines. When he feels bad, he does it. And he was quite sick towards the end of his life. Uh, now, uh, we might get to that eventually a little bit, but for example, this writing about against the Jews is really not, not tolerable. I, I find it offensive. I, I love it. But uh, the <laughs> if you read any of the contemporary Jewish prophets, Anabaptists, Roman Catholic. It's the exception that doesn't talk like that. So in that sense, we are living in a different world. And among us, educated people uh, use different language from the language that Luther used. And, and it's in these, in these things. Of course, he doesn't use it in many other things, but in the, in the in this uh, attack against uh, all, all the papers in Rome founded by the devil. You know? uh, that, that, that is, this is full of, 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 of the same kind of vitriolic language that he uses on the Juden in the of the Jews and the lions. And I, I think there's no point in it. You know, when we, had, when we came out of the American edition, we, uh, I had something to do. I, I did one volume. One, one, 32. And uh, that was an easy one. That was not, no problem. There. But uh, in, in some of the later volumes, we had to ask ourselves, are we going to translate some of this stuff? But we did at the volume on, on his writings against the Jew. And we figured that uh, it would be cowardly to, to, and there's a very good introduction to it by Franklin Sherman, the editor, and uh, in which he says, we are ashamed that he was right. It's right. We are, we are but uh, it isn't as if we didn't use language like that about the Pope, about, about uh, anybody, Anabaptist, anybody he didn't like. So it was not given to uh, my honorary friend, you know, honorable friend, uh, you know, uh, to Dr. Eck. <coughs> he never made, paid any attention to the period of the doctor, DR. If you write Dr. Eck, D R E C K, that's the word that you need to hear about. <laughs> you know what that means. The German word direct is also a word for excrement. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a stronger word, but he used that, that didn't fit direct. Uh, Dr. Eck seems like, a, like the ideal. Possibility. <coughs> Excuse me. It would seem to me that there would be quite a, a great amount of justification <coughs> for the, the backlash that you'd say that, that offensive uh, language uh, denotes because of the, the opposition, the, the great opposition. It's just, it's right in front of them. Uh, as you know, Eck never referred to Luther as Luther, but Luda. Luda is, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, a shit Luda. That, that, that's, a, that, that's a, I don't know the exact English word. But, 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 an animal, a dead animal. Roadkill. Yeah. Dr. Roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, isn't Paul also known for his uh, way of talking, that he was pretty earthy? So, you know, again, the passion that he spoke with in Luther as well. That yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we could, we, we could sp spend a good deal of time on, on uh, Luther's language. Uh, you know, when he translated the Bible, he avoided using the polite language of uh, the upper classes. He said, he went to the markets and listened to people talking. Man muss den Leuten aufs Maul schauen, he said. You have to look how people really talk, and then you can make the Bible speak as it was written. 
this is ordinary people talking ordinary language. Now, of course, it becomes classical German, you see, <laughs> but, but, but it was at one point very ordinary language. Now, um, I said much of Luther's writings, as we call Luther's writings, is based on uh, notes from students, whether of lectures, of sermons, table talks. And these have to be corrected when they deal with theological issues if they tend to disagree with what he writes in his own, with his own hand. Because <clears throat> on theological questions, sometimes uh, people shift, people heard what they wanted to hear, and not what he said. I'll give you an illustration. I preached for two years, every Sunday, in German and in English, in a little congregation in Woodbury, New Jersey. I picked up an old lady. I was, at that time, 22 years old, so she was an old lady. To me, she was probably seven, younger than I am now. And uh, took her to the German service, since she had no transportation. I did that for two years. Then she said tearfully goodbye to me when I uh, had resigned. And after listening to me for two years, preaching justification by grace to faith, she said, well, Pastor, we'll miss you so much, but as long as we live a good life, Two years of justification, by the way, and all she picked up was, as long as, that's what she heard. That's not what I said. And the problem always is, when you are dependent on people that, on people's notes, that you will find in those notes what they heard and not what the person said. And so I believe whenever you have something really startling from one of those uh, uh, notes from students, and it is totally different from what the man says in everything else. Forget it. You, you, you can't take it. And, and, and people, in the critical edition, people are trying to do that. Now, this raises a lot, number of questions with, um, with the Genesis commentary, because the Genesis commentary has obviously been sort of influenced by, by a Melanchthonian <laughs> who, 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 uh, who heard what Luther according to Melanchthon. And so there are as the theological aspects in the Genesis commentary which are not uh, particularly in line with, with, with basic Luther. So you have to be a little careful about the reliability of these sources. Can you give us a for instance? Pardon me? Can you give us a for instance? Well, the tendency to make uh, justification so forensic that that means that nothing happens in the life of the justified. You see, Luther himself always sees the person who declares you just, though you are a sinner, as being God. And if you do this, the God who declares you just also has the power to make you what he declares you to be. A judge doesn't have that power. You see the difference? A judge can acquit you and say, you are not guilty. <laughs> but you are guilty and not even repentant. But when God declares the sinner saint, then he also has the power to work on this person to become what he has declared him to be. So, so because the, the judge is not just any human judge, but God, there he has, Luther uses language like taking a rusty sword and sharpening it, you know. God works on us. Now, we're not saving ourselves, don't get me wrong. But God is a powerful God who, who creates, who recreates us in conformity. And, that's what Luther means when he says it very simply in the small catechism that the old Adam is to be drowned by daily repentance. 
you know, and a new person is to arise every day. This is, this is an ongoing process, not just an abstract uh, declaration where nothing happens. Something has happened all the time. Simul used to sit together at the same time, righteous and the same. This, this is a process that goes on in the Christian life to the day we die. There's an article in the book that you just read at some length. Uh, then there are some newer discoveries of Luther's writings that uh, affected our understanding of especially the young Luther uh, considerably. Strangely enough, Luther's commentary on Romans, which he presented, and that is based on his own lecture note, between 1515 and 1516. I remember this as a year before the 95 uh, was lost. Benefer quoted and that, 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 that he had access to the Vatican Library. The Vatican Library had gotten the whole collection of uh, theological works that the Catholic powers, Wallenstein and Tim, had stolen from Heidelberg <laughs> and uh, shipped, to, shipped to Rome. And he had, uh, he uh, was a first rate. Uh, uh, archivist. He had gone through these archives and found these. Now, but this, this was a copy. Where was the origin? There's a fascinating story in Paul's uh, uh, edition of the of, uh, Romans in the Library of Christian Classic. The right hand often doesn't know what the left hand is doing. In the biggest German library, the, the, the Imperial Library in Berlin, the, they had an exhibit of uh, outstanding classical German handwriting. And there was a volume of Luther. And Ficker, one of these uh, scholars, by accident, I said, what is this? He had it opened up. I got the box opened up. Look at, that was Luther's original Roman's commentary. <laughs> that had been completely lost and showed up in an exhibit of German handwriting. And uh, he, uh, of course, he, he edited it and, and it came out independently from the Weimar edition first. And uh, it got into the Weimar edition much later. But, but the, the, it, it threw a new light on, on, on Luther's thought. Uh, it was published first uh, in 1908. The uh, first lectures on Galatians, which Luther gave in 1516, were lost till 1918 when they were published. And uh, his preparations for lectures on the Psalms, which he probably made in 1516, were published from 1940. So uh, we have, in this century, I mean the 20th century, discovered all kinds of early Luther material, which uh, was simply lost. Although in the library, yes. Well, these are. This is when it was published in English. No, 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 in German. Oh, in German. In German. No, but it, there is nothing of the Romans commentary in the Weiss edition in the St. Louis edition. They didn't have access. To it. The Weiss edition had no access to it. It's early Luther material was 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 simply lost. Ever once in a while, even now, stop. Mostly lecture Some in some library in Germany, somebody finds some lecture notes 
that some student who then moved back to Swabia or wherever it was, and his stuff was deposited in the library, nobody paid any attention to it. And then suddenly it shows up. It's just amazing. As I said, even in the Weimar edition, not all the material is equally reliable. Uh, you could say you can divide Luther material into three groups. First of all, welcome. First of all, works or fragments which Luther himself wrote and gave to the printer or handwriting, handwritten material that is still preserved. The Romans commentary comes to mind. Secondly, reliable notes. In this group, there are certain authors, a fellow by the name of Verla, is one of the most reliable uh, reporters on Luther's writings, uh, Luther's lectures. And then uh, more or less reliable material. And I said the uh, table talks belong to the less reliable material. And one would have to base anything that he said in the table talks on uh, confirmation from his genuine, certainly genuine writing. They are sometimes colorful additions, but uh, they are not uh, uh, totally reliable. Uh, let me say something about issues in Luther research, as you will uh, encounter it. And I would suggest six areas that are of particular importance in the Luther research of the last hundred years. The first area is when did Luther become a Luther? That is a very controverted issue. Uh, it is often connected with the so-called Tau experience, the famous Turm Erlebnis, the Tau experience. Now, Lutherans always wanted to know exactly when this took place. When did he have that insight. Now, this thing got more complicated. Now you, you again, I have to tell you another one of the story. Dinner pointed out that the tower in most monasteries was a toilet. And he suggested that Luther had his great experience while sitting on the toilet. <laughs> Now, that upset the Lutherans just terribly. They were trying their darndest to prove that certainly in Wittenberg, the tower was not the toilet. But on the other hand, all the Freudians now began to <coughs> come in and write eloquent books, Norman or Brown, E. E. Erickson, they had lots of books about the importance of the tower experience because it was on the toilet. And, uh, and so you have a, 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 an incredible uh, argument about this. Uh, I have attended, I'm probably the only person who has attended every Luther Research Congress since the first one in Arkham's right after the Second World War. That's because I live so long. That's the reason. And I've gone through all of them. And the last time it turned out I was the only survivor that was, had been at all of them. But one of the more boring topics in those many meetings that we've had 
is the topic of when exactly did this Tower experience take place? I think Luther developed the position over a long period of time and then focused it on some moment where he thought, no, retrospectively, that's when, when the lightning hit, that's when he uh, got it straight. Uh, there are today uh, a note, strange enough, a, the first one, Karl Hall and most of the whole Schule, because of their love for the writings of the early Luther, have the uh, Kala experience uh, fairly early, 15, 15, 14, 16. That means considerably before the 95 Theses. An American Finn by the name of Uras Sarnivara wrote a dissertation at the University of Chicago in which he claimed that Luther became a Lutheran much later. And then a German professor by the name of Ernst Bieser, B-I-Z-E-R, Fides uh, ex auditu, uh, took the position that Sarnavara was right, that it was much later than Hall and his students had suggested. Now let me tell you what the focus of that argument is. When you read the early psalm commentaries of 1513, 1550, or the Romans commentary of 1515 and 1560, there is a great emphasis on humilitas, on humility, of, of these are all in Latin, on humility. And the late advocates say humility is unlutheran because it is a dispositio ad gratia, a disposition to grace. And that means that's a Roman Catholic notion that you don't receive God, God's forgiveness until you are ready by your disposition. And so there is a justification is based on human readiness. And you have to contribute your readiness for God to save you. And only later on, even after the 95 Thesis, do you have uh, the emphasis on fides rather than on humilitas, on faith rather than on humility. Uh, the distinguished Danish Luther scholar, Regian Prenter, P-R-E-N-T-R, took the position that uh, he took the, the position that uh, these two things, humilitas and fides, aren't as different as Pizzer and Sanayvara and people like that have insisted on. Uh, the separation is therefore against Luther's intention. And therefore, you can date the um, beginning of Luther's Lutheran theology earlier than these others have suggested. Um, I'm repeating this argument not because I think it's very important, but I'm repeating it because it has been so central in the literature everybody's arguing about. It. I think it's really not very important where, in, where this moment took place. Uh, Luther obviously already in these early lectures has a different approach 
two humilitas from his predecessor. Uh, and often there are certain other theological considerations that I suggest to people one position or the other. Yes? Does it perhaps have to do with uh, Armenian, Armenian thought? Well, yes. It has, it, it, I mean, Armenius is a much later bishop. You know, that, that has nothing to do. But I know what you mean. The whole business of cooperation. I mean, the whole, the whole basic question that, that is still a, a really an argument between Roman Catholics and Lutherans for the state, not to mention between Lutherans and Methodists. Uh, or uh, Moravians and Methodists, you know, that the, 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 their whole question is, what do I contribute to my own salvation? And the mature Luther says nothing. Does he not uh, talk about the law? Pardon me? Does, does not Luther talk about the law as driving us to seek for the grace of yeah, God? Yeah, but the law destroys us. I mean, the law by itself is, he talks about uh, Law, death, and devil. So what does he mean when he says that it makes us seek for grace? Well, is that the law that drives us to despair until Christ comes and, and uh, announces that, uh, un, until we are overwhelmed by God's mercy. But that is not, that is not an achievement. In, the law can very easily drive one to despair. So it's God's power. Basically, you remember Luther's own experience. Luther tried it with the law. He tried it as hard as anybody, and, and, and the law didn't get him any place. The law only uh, drove him further and further into despair. It was only when he let go of his own attempt to save himself and so let God be God. So you would say then that Luther meant that God gives us the power to seek for the grace. Right. And for, for Luther, uh, for the mature Luther, the Lutheran Luther, the salvation is entirely God's work in us. Yes? Why would it not have come at that time when he finally realized that while he was still at the monastery that he became a Lutheran? Well, uh, apparently not, because you see, he went up all the stairs in, the, in Rome on his knees hoping that he hoping that he could sort of uh, work his way in. He, he really, I mean, he tried it. He tried it very hard and found that uh, the harder he tried, the less he succeeded. In fact, you know, there were people that, like his father confessor, said, God isn't mad at you, you are mad at God. The, the, uh, the, this, but, but, the, but the real issue in Luther's theology is that salvation is entirely God's work in us and not our own achievement. Now, um, it's very un-American. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, Luther, Luther's attitude is that we can't save ourselves. And to, the, to most Americans, that is just the most unbelievable. You know, we can save ourselves, sure. Buy a book, uh, three steps to <laughs> salvation. Yeah. Would, would Luther, in your estimation, say that God could work on someone to some extent and they would fall short of salvation? Uh, God can save people if he wants to. Uh, but they, he might let them refuse him I, I, I'll give you a silly illustration. Uh, you can keep the sun from coming into your room by holding the shades down. But there's a strong spring in these shades, and the sun beats down on you and burns your hands. And if it burns, the better off you let go. But it is you, you were trying to keep the sun out. The sun over, overwhelmed you. So for, I mean, you are getting here in the very center of Luther's uh, justificatio impi, the justification of God. That, that it is, God saves 
while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sin. And that's not really the way. A very respectable view. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and so, so the, the, it is, the initiative is God's. The resistance is ours. Uh, Calvin would say uh, there are some people that God just isn't interested in. Luther doesn't say there isn't any mass of perdition. There isn't, there isn't the, a horrible decree. You never find that. But you find in Luther the ability of people to uh, resist God's grace uh, seemingly forever. So you, Luther is no universal. And, you know, we are right here in the very center of one of the more controversial issues in the history of the Christian Church. And, and, and you will see how Luther uh, handles this, because Luther thinks when you start talking about it as a theoretical problem, you are already missing the point. It's never a theory. You can never say it sort of in the abstract. It's how does God, how have you experienced God? Do you, did you save yourself? Even, even uh, most people, even w would say that it was God who pushed them. Uh, now, the people that say they saved themselves are witnesses to unskilled believe. <laughs> Self-made men, but uh, the the the, the uh, for Luther is always God, and we will. This is so central for him that uh, that we can't avoid it. It will come up again and again in everything we read. The second uh, issue is Luther's understanding of creation, reason, and law. Uh, and uh, it's very important to understand Luther's understanding, uh, Luther's view of creation, Luther's view of reason. I have another student, uh, his book hasn't been published yet, who wrote a book on, on a positive, a book on Luther's understanding of reason. And it's beautiful. It's not person working. He wrote. Uh, on the positive evaluation of Luther of reason in every area except in our relationship to God. Reason is the way we solve everything in this world. In our relationship to God, it is useless. If we try to reason ourselves to God, we get an idea. And here, you'll see that in one of the first things we'll read from next, our next session in the, in the Heidelberg Disputation. That, that uh, that's the theology of glory that he has no use for. But uh, but on the other hand, reason is an important gift of God. It is a devil's whore. That's his language. Das Teufelsur. If we use reason to try to reach God, but if we use reason to build ships or run the government, what? I mean, for example, uh, all the, the parts of our life that are given to us as creatures of God have to be dealt with business. That's the importance of the law, too. They are, we deal with them the law, but we can't reach God using the law. That's the second area in which there has been a great deal of work in the last hundred years. And the third area is Luther's teaching of the sacrament. Um, obviously, Luther's teaching of the sacrament is quite different from even the Roman Catholic or the general reform people. Um, that's true even on baptism, but also, of course, particularly in the world's And uh, 
Lapis, where he insists on the real presence on the sacrament as a means of grace. The fourth area is the area of justification and sanctification. And uh, we have already uh, hinted at it about where you see uh, in the history of Christianity very often you become a Eustace after you have been a Picato. You become righteous after you've been a sinner. And there's sort of a progress from sin to righteousness. For Luther, a Christian is always righteous when he looks at God through Jesus Christ. A sinner when he looks at himself or herself. If I trust myself, I'm a sinner. If I look at myself, I'm a sinner. Even at the end of his life, Luther wrote in one of his last letters, we are in Etla Altsumar. We are always beggars. In relationship to God, it's always God's gift and not our accomplishment. But uh, in our relationship to our neighbor, we can do righteous things through God's grace. And so it isn't a total separation. Sinners have been made righteous. But sin remains until we die. And you are not righteous in a sense that you have achieved righteousness on your own, even in your last stages as a Christian. You don't go, there's no progress to perfection. In fact, the perfection, when you claim perfection, that's a more serious sign of your sinfulness. And so that's where Wesley has such a terrible time to At first he liked him. And then he began to be very skeptical of it because he was denied this uh, Christian perfection. Uh, not a sanctification, but perfection. Perfection is always an alien perfection. It's an justitia aliena, an alien justice. We are covered by God's righteousness. We do not achieve it on our own. Uh, and this creates all this 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 problem of the 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 persistence of sin and the reality of sanctification is an issue that has uh, uh, led many uh, theologians to write on this particular problem. The fifth area is uh, the notion of church and state. Because of uh, the involvement of Germany with the Nazis, this particular problem was uh, became particularly acute. And that's in fact where I got into the uh, my own book of research and my book, Faith, Active, and Love, which I tried to teach my teacher, Reinhold Lieber, that Luther wasn't as socially irresponsible as Reinhold Lieber had claimed in the nature of destiny of men. I got to be <laughs> He was a very nice man. He didn't mind that I disagreed with him. But he, my claim, of course, has been that, that from the beginning of his life, as was the, in the end of his life, Luther was engaged in social action. At 95 theses, there was social action. He didn't, he didn't bind up. 
he was involved. He didn't. He was doing over by debts and stuff. It was his responsibility for people that are being ripped off. It was a social responsibility that led him to take issue with that song and the indulgences. And at the end of his life, he went to Mansfeld to solve the problems of these counts that were fighting over some mining property. That wasn't any of the, anything that he needed. He wanted to help them to settle a problem that was ripping a family apart. From beginning to end, Luther was socially responsible. And he was his, his entire ethics was uh, turning human love from God to the neighbor. He says all the time, again and again, God doesn't need your love. The proper response to God is trust, faith. God takes your love and turns it to the neighbor. Your neighbor needs your love. If you uh, have read here, I stand by by Roald Dayton. He has a wonderful, I think he has a quotation uh, about one of Luther's Christmas sermons where Luther describes the scene in which uh, uh, the baby is born and they have not come in. And he, he, he describes it in great detail. He has practically the entire a congregation in tears and he says that, of course, if you had been there, you would have come and helped. You, you would have been the first ones to help. Look, there are poor people in Wittenberg. Where are you? You could do that. And he turns it right around from this general uh, admiration for the infant Jesus and says, you have people right here in Wittenberg that you can help. If you are so holy, why would you do something? And that's typical faith active in love with you. you, you uh, faith is expressed in love to the neighborhood. And so much of the stuff that uh, has been written about Israel and Hitler is, of course, nonsense. Uh, and finally, uh, sixth, the discussion has been around the exegetical principles of Luther's uh, interpretation of the word of God. Uh, and there, uh, Dr. Gerhard Ebeling and people like that have um, helped us to understand them, and of course, uh, to help, help us to, to see how he tries to free the scripture from this uh, obfuscation through the oligarchical method and the scripture as a way we would clearly meet a Christ, the cradle of Christ. Uh, I think I will stop here and ask you if you have any questions. And uh, call it a day. Yes. Um, you mentioned the American edition. Uh, you're, I mean, you were talking about the, the, the amount of work available to read. Um, but not everything has been translated. Not the entire Weimar edition has been translated. Is it, um, would it be considered worthwhile for somebody to, to translate more? To translate more? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I mean, the, the, the 50, look, we have only, we have only small collections, of, especially also of the sermons, very few sermons. And uh, but there's all kinds of stuff that still could be translated. It's and, and you know the people have made a lot of money. Concordia and, and, and Corpus have made a fortune on these 55 volumes. I know because I got 200 dollars. Some of them have made money. And uh, the the uh, the this has been you know a bestseller. Now unfortunately not necessarily because everybody's read it. But because so many people bought it and put it on the shelves, it makes it very much better than wallpaper. 
it <laughs> makes a terrific uh, uh, enriching uh, uh, furniture for your house. But, but I, think, I think it would be nice if you have more people to do this. Um, what would be your reaction to a scholar who said that that would not be a worthwhile endeavor, that to translate anything more would be redundant? Well, if you would translate, I, I just think that uh, uh, more, the more Luther, the better. But of course, I'm prejudiced. I, I think there are lots of things that, that uh, are still quickly translated to help us. Yes? Well, picking up on that from a, from a uh, scholarly standpoint, uh, we would assume that scholars have read all of this anyway. So there's, there's nothing that hasn't been translated that would necessarily lend any particular new well, insight, is there? Well, um, would you say we should not uh, pr uh, play certain parts of Mozart since we have already so many wonderful things of Mozart, why should we have more in our collection? My, my claim is that, that Luther is to the theology what Mozart is to music. There is no, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can never have enough. But you know, you're not talking to the most unprejudiced person on the earth. I, I do love him, and I think uh, he hardly ever wrote anything really more. And the sermons are particularly long, and I'm sorry that brother did not hear that. And you know, the sermons were where his heart was. You know, he said he had a fellow in, uh, who was a pastor, the senior pastor in Wittenberg, was the fellow of the and. Uh, and Luther wanted to preach. So Luther sent Guggenhagen all over Europe to reform churches in Denmark and Europe. And he was always the supply preacher. He preached it. He loved to preach. And, and uh, Guggenhagen was very useful, a very good man in doing this performance stuff. But, but Luther uh, took every opportunity. And what kind of a preacher he was. Unfortunately, I think you know, it would have been nice if he had really been a preacher. But you know, when he was in the Wartburg and things went from bad to worse, a bit more, we may remember that, that instance. Uh, the last thing in hand, and you have these people going to destroy all the images, and, you know, all, all chaos was breaking out. Of the and finally, what does he say? I don't care what happens to you. He wrote a letter to the elector and said, I realize, uh, your, your highness, that uh, it's too tragic to take.